Welcome everyone to what we hope will prove to be an informative and insightful discussion about mitigating cyber risks and some of the best approaches you can take to that end. I'm Rocky Merchandani, anchor and contributing editor at The Trust, the custom content studio and creative consultancy at the Wall Street Journal and Barron's Group. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. First, we really want you to participate in these conversations, and we have two ways for you to do that. First, We'll certainly be taking questions from you, which you can submit in the box below your video player. And second, we'll also have an audience poll, a couple of poll questions a bit later during the conversation. To view and to add your reply to the poll question, you're gonna to toggle to the poll tab in the questions box. We're gonna cover as many audience questions as we can in about the last 15 minutes or so of the session. In the meantime, you should feel free to connect with fellow attendees in the chat panel to the right. And if you encounter any difficulties, please take a look at our tech tips by clicking the small question mark on the top right of the site. I'm thrilled to be joined by Ari Schwartz. And before we kick off our conversation with him, I'll give you a bit of a brief bio for context. These days, Ari oversees cybersecurity services for the Cybersecurity Risk Management Group at Venable LLP, where he has guided the establishment of the firm's cybersecurity consulting services. Prior to joining Venable, Ari was a member of the White House National Security Council, where he served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Cybersecurity. Welcome, Ari. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Rocky. I'm thrilled for this conversation. We don't have much time, so I wanna hop right in. Ari, cyber risk mitigation really isn't the first practice area that maybe comes to mind when folks think of law firms. Can you tell us why it's so important at Venable? Well, so Venable uh, has had one of the oldest and largest privacy legal practices in the world. And they saw very early on, uh, especially as uh, data breach laws were passing and uh, the uh, liability for organizations was increasing, that working with cyber uh, risk firms was important. They, at first, they partnered with consultancies, but then uh, it's, it's about six, seven years ago when I left uh, government, they uh, brought me in-house to try and uh, build a team that could do it internally. And today we have a team of 20 uh, non-legal professionals working together. Some of them are the best known experts in the world on different pieces of this. And we help to do both the kind of operational piece of helping people as well as the policy side. When you talk about the operational piece and also the policy side, I, I'm curious about the foundational elements. So can you tell me a little bit about sort of what are the foundational elements of good cyber risk mitigation today? Well, uh, you, you know, the, a lot of this has to do with uh, knowing how to measure, how to manage, and make sure that you have the adequate resources you need to deal with these pieces, right? So, you know, too often um, I've been in situations where I've heard cyber professionals say we've got it under control to their leadership. And to, in today's world, that's never the right answer. No one has it totally under control. Right, it, cyber risk mitigation means involving your leadership in these discussions, and then getting to that point of knowing how to grow with it, how and how to uh, to take the journey to the point where you are addressing these issues. I think you're absolutely right about not having it under control, and that idea of, of that that's a great point. I want to talk a little bit about the cybersecurity framework that you've developed as a planning tool for your clients, Ari. Can you talk us through sort of the core components? Yeah, well, actually, I mean, it was built at NIST originally, uh, the cybersecurity framework. It was created in 2012. Uh, it came out of a executive order that uh, President Obama put together. And really, the goal of it was to create the Rosetta Stone for cybersecurity risk management, right? The, the, the uh, different sectors use different terminology and different standards for their cybersecurity controls. And the framework is really made to tie them together under a set of functions, right? And those are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And it allows uh, organizations to create baselines, to create measurements, et cetera, across these functions uh, tied to the control set, and then be able to tie that across different sectors um, or to, so that different people coming in know exactly what those terms mean, even if it ties into a specific set within that company or within that sector. So uh, that that has really helped 
to create, uh, to turn cyber risk management from a kind of sector by sector discipline into something that works across the uh, across industry. Um, and I think it's actually helped to increase the ability of um, regulators and national security experts also to understand what is going on in different companies and different sectors. Sorry, what kind of advice do you have for C-suite folks really trying to reach that next level of security for their enterprises? Yeah, so I, I think the, the, the biggest thing is understanding where the greatest risk is. Uh, we often go into companies and the, there's a fixation from the board or from a, a C, some, someone in the C-suite on one particular issue that doesn't that they've heard about from some other company um, or that happened at their last company, you know, instead of trying to get a, a real feel for where is the liability for this company? Where's the greatest risk for this company? What visibility do they have into what's happening in the organization? Um, is it improving over time? Uh, you know, those kinds of questions, I think, are the ones that we want to see. And it's really about um, the, the, the C-suite asking the right questions um, and having an understanding of what's going on. And when you say asking the right questions, Ari, do you mind just taking a second and... and Kind of, I wanted to stay there for a second. What do you mean by that? Like asking for the right questions. What kind of questions are we we're talking about? Well, and so uh, a lot of times when we're working with a board, um, you'll want to have a, a, truly a dashboard for them or, or for the leadership, a dashboard where they set, where, you, where when you're doing cyber risk management, you, you have a set of uh, areas that you want to focus on for the year or over a certain period of time. And, and you show progress over that period of time, right? And you have the, the kind of insight, the visibility into those different areas so that you can demonstrate that you've, you've improved in those areas. And then at the end of the year, you look at it again, right? It's a journey, as I was saying, right? It's not something that you, uh, and, and, and management is like, you know, knows about this from financial issues, right? They deal with the same type of risk management for financial issues all the time. Just when you start to talk to them about technical issues, their eyes glaze over. So you have to put it in a, in the same type of way uh, that they can understand it and where they get engaged in the issue um, and, and, you know, getting to the point of having them understand that. And there's accountability there, too. So thank you for that. I want to pause quickly uh, for our first poll question for the audience. So just, again, as a refresher to answer, you're going to toggle to that poll tab in the questions box. So for our first question, how important is security and performance integration to your organization? Is it very important, not a priority, but should be, or not important to us? So go ahead and answer that. We'll give you, we'll give you a minute or so to answer it, and I'll be back to you with the results. But in the meantime, uh, Ari, you talked about visibility a couple of times. How does visibility fit into cyber risk mitigation and do complex organizations have the visibility they need to really be able to reliably detect, understand, and then address threats? Yeah, so in the macro sense, it is, it's exactly what I've been talking about, which is that they uh, that leadership knows how to measure risk and make decisions, right? That's, that's what I mean by visibility in that sense. But there's also the visibility in the micro sense, right, that... Um, and this is really where we get into some of the, the nitty gritty here into, you know, what is normal look like on, in, in your systems? What is it on your network, on your corporate devices? Um, if you don't have that kind of visibility, you can't really uh, do the kind of measurement that you need to get to, at the at the um, at this information. And historically, we, we've done that through through logs, through endpoint detection, you know, EDR, through network detection, NDR. But as we move to as, as we move to more traffic being encrypted and and move to more information being in the cloud and the spread of devices, right, through IoT and, and eventually 5G, it's going to be it's becoming a lot more complicated to keep track of this. And that's one of the reasons you hear a lot more about XDR right now, which is you know trying to solve this problem by pulling to, together the wider range of tele telemetry across the board and see into some of these areas. Our poll results are coming in. It looks like about 90% of you say that cyber, uh, that it's very important. About 9% say it's not a priority and about 1% say it's not important. So that's that's our first result. It does, it does fall well in line with what you're saying, Ari. Um, I wanna ask you a little bit about security and performance. Where does security and performance come together in good cyber risk mitigation, in your opinion? And where have you seen recent innovations in this space? Yeah, I, well, one thing I like to talk about is like, we, you know, it used to be you see these poll questions like, what's more important, performance or security or privacy? And 
people would have to pick one, right? And but in reality, that's not what what where we are today, right? You have to do all of them at the same time. And I think one of the things that we're seeing from some new tools in this space is that they're aimed at monitoring m- monitoring packet data, being able to demonstrate that you can do both performance that, that, that to help with performance. At the same time, you can also see in and see uh, what type of information is being shared there. And in the enterprise cloud in particular, right, this is the key way to ensure that things are going right. Like you can you can really get a sense of what's happening uh, b- behind the scenes in a way that you can in other, with other tools. Are you also coordinate the Cybersecurity Coalition? And I'd like to ask you a little bit to talk about that and how open are your member companies to collaborating, right, about security, about policy, about expertise? And maybe you could talk also a little bit about sort of the good things or highlights that have come out of that coalition. Yeah, so the, so the coalition I think um, is a is a um, it, it is the privacy the policy side of what I was talking about before, but that that we do the operational side and the policy side, and so uh, it's a group of cybersecurity companies and tech companies that have cybersecurity units that we've worked together with over time to produce uh, to improve cybersecurity. And when I, so when when I got when I was in the White House, that I, we have so many trade associations come to us and they tell me why something was good for them or bad for them. With my focus being national security. No one came to us just to talk about security, right? And the, the goal of the Cybersecurity Coalition is to get the real security experts together um, and come and talk about what is good for security as well as what's good for business uh, and where those overlap. And we can have uh, open conversations with people and explain that in a way where they, they don't feel as though we're just saying that uh, because that's what's good for business. But what is good for security is good for these companies' business as well. So uh, it's a, a key point there. and and. We do see uh, competitors work together very well. Um, I mean, the, the the best example that I, the one I like to come back to, because it was one of the first things that we did, and it really shows um, uh, what makes us different. Is you've had so many uh, uh, when 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 NAFTA was being uh, renegotiated, uh, right? You had this new USMCA being discussed, and the tech trade associations had a list of twelve things that they wanted, and number ten on the list. With cybersecurity cooperation uh, or across uh, Mexico and Canada and the U.S., and we said, you know, we're going to go in, and that's all we're going to talk about. And it, it's one of the things that got done, right? All of that list of twelve things, maybe two or three of them got done. Number ten on the list got done because we were the ones making it the only thing we cared about. And there was no disagreement from Mexico or Canada with what the U.S. wanted to do and what we wanted to do. So uh, it was very easy to get through, through, but someone needed to focus on it and demonstrate that it was good for business and for security at the same time. I love that example that you just shared. Are you able to kind of pull out maybe a couple other examples of um, successes that the coalition has, has had or fo- the way folks work together? That's so interesting. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, one one thing that we did um, uh, early on, uh, actually, as well, and that has become kind of more commonplace, we were talking about the NIST cybersecurity framework before, and and um, the, under the NIST cybersecurity framework, they create these profiles, and most of the profiles um, when the, when the when the framework was was created were focused on uh, specifically on sectors, right? So you have a, a telecommunication sector one. You have an energy sector one. You have a, a even like the, the hospitals, hotels, hospitality has one, right? So you have these different sectors that have their profiles. But what we did was we tried to do a cross cut. Working with NIST, we did a cross cut for botnets and uh, um, for other types of threats. Um, and now that has become very commonplace too. And what that means is. Um, if you're a company that is, that cares about a ransomware, for example, and you t- you take the ransomware threat uh, uh, profile, you can take that and then take your uh, industry sector, and you can focus on the specific controls for your sector. So that's a good example of you know when people say, well, it, you know, we're not only concerned about this sector, but we're also concerned about this specific type of threat. How to go about doing it? And the coalition was the one that kind of put that idea together and made it happen. And now it's commonplace that people uh, do that as well. So that's an example of something that's sort of outside of the Washington uh, sphere that shows kind of how co- we're getting companies to work together on policy can address some of these issues. Thank you. I want to ask another poll question uh, to the audience. Do you do you feel that you have enough visibility, the visibility you need to detect, understand, and address threats across your digital ecosystem? Yes, 
mostly not enough or not at all. And Ari, once we get those results, I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh, based on them, sort of what folks can do about that. So I'll give folks a second to answer that. In the meantime, Ari, what do you think the current, in, sort of current intelligence tends to point to certain segments, right? Like healthcare as having particularly penetrable cyber defense. Why do you think that is? And really, what could these segments be doing better to mitigate cyber risk? Yeah, so um, I mean, the White House has emphasized like healthcare, particularly hospitals, the water sector, K twelve is being uh, schools being as major concerns, and I mean, a lot of that comes from uh, the, the attacks we've seen, particularly um, ransomware, uh, you know, and efforts to kind of pick them off. So I, I, you know, I can't disagree with the what the government's choices are on that list. Um, you know. I think people are moving in the right direction. You know, it comes back, we were talking, you were talking about risk management before, and it comes back to risk management. It's slightly different in different sectors. Um, but uh, we do see, and also as we were talking about, you know, this, this issue um, in hospitals, you're bringing a lot more devices in there. You're networking a lot more. Uh, they're more reliant on, on the technology, which they hadn't been in the past. And so with that comes the threats. And you have to, at the same time, you're ramping up uh, the use of it. I mean, and and, and the, the, I mean, this audience knows that would be on listening to this knows that you know, with with that uh, luxury of uh, of bit using more devices, getting more network, you get more information. You also have new, more security threats, and you have to uh, invest in them in the right way. For too long, you know, larger enterprises have not uh, um, were not really investing in the space. They've started investing more now, but some of these sectors have still have a long way to go. You mentioned some of the other sectors, and I want to ask you, are there other sort of like world can't live without segments that are behind the curve? And are there some that you think are ahead of the curve? Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, the education in general has been behind the curve. In the K-12 to schools, it's because people haven't really put money toward it. In higher education, it's because it's a very difficult challenge because you want to have open campuses, but at the same time, you have uh, threats all over the place. Um, you know, we know in water that in, in some some of the large in, institutions, like it's, it's all over the place in terms of in, in the U.S., that whether it's a large company or it's a small company involved, um, you know, we often look at other countries and see what they're doing that so well, you know, I was in Israel not so long ago and I kind of asked this question like, uh, you know, what do you do if you see something with the water sector and you have a problem there? And he's, the, the guy says like, well, I call my friend uh, Duddy, who I was in the army with and and he fixes it, right? We don't have that luxury in the US. You can't, we, we don't have someone in each of these water facilities. Some of them are very tiny. Some of them are enormous. So the more you have sectors like that, where there's not, the re where you have different types of organizations and they're disparate all over the place, the harder it is to protect. And I think, um, especially when the, the regulatory structure is not centralized like that. Uh, but oh, the, ba the banks, in terms of who does well, you know, I want to, you know, the banks do well. Um, governments are a little bit mixed. Um, you know, I think the federal government has done better recently um, and state governments have started to do better. Local governments have done worse, we've seen. so. I love that example uh, about the about the water in Israel. Thanks for that. Um, I want to go back to our poll question, Ari. So we asked, do you have the visibility you need to detect, understand, and address threats across your digital ecosystem? And 15% of folks are saying yes. 43% are saying mostly. 39% say not enough. And 3% say not at all. And so, Ari, I want to ask you... Um, you know, for folks who are saying not enough or not at all, what are things that they might be able to do to improve that in their organization? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the key is is doing the convincing, right? So it is <laughs> it is making the presentation in the right way um, that demonstrates um, the risk. I mean, some of that is measuring yourself against other organizations. I think um, a lot of times uh, people have felt as though we don't have baselines for certain sectors, and that makes it really hard. Um, as you can get together and, and have discussions with other people in your profession and kind of, uh, you know, uh, work to try and create anonymous baselines, which some sectors are doing. Um, you know, I've been I've been talking to MIT quite a bit about uh, about this because that's something they're focused on is how to get uh, this information across the board 
to people um, uh, so that it's not you're not giving away the state secrets for one particular company, but uh, at the same time sharing that information and getting the baseline out of it, right? So that those the more we can do that kind of work, the the, the easier it is going to be to kind of make the case uh, we need more information. Um, some trade associations are doing that. The uh, ISACs and the ISAOs, the information sharing organizations, are key to starting to do that as well. So I would suggest joining those, uh, having conversations with them for your sector uh, or area and region, because some of the ISAOs are regional, um, and, and and trying to get that information uh, so that you can make the case better. Um, I also think, um, you know, as I said about dashboards, you know, being able to kind of uh, really play out how this looks for uh, leadership in terms of you know making it easier for them to understand where they where you need to get to and then the resources you might need to get there. We've heard before that sometimes making those convincing arguments uh, in, in can be difficult, right? In, in organizations, so I think that the dashboards and keeping folks accountable is a great idea, and also comparing right to other folks in your sector and other companies and and how other other folks are faring. Um, Ari, in your experience, do Cyber criminals sort of avoid enterprises that have superior security in place. What do you think? Well, I mean, they're really looking, criminals in particular, right, are looking for weaknesses. They're knocking on every door. They have a specific specific way of entry that they're looking for at that particular time. They might be looking at a specific sector where they know that that weakness uh, is, is more prevalent. Um, and they're going to knock on door. But if they, they knock on doors, if the control is in place to stop them, they, they move on, right? We know that. Um, that this is the, but the difference is this is the difference between state actors um, and why we talk about persistent threats sometimes because the state actors are different. Like they they try lots of different means to get in. They stick with it. They work on a nine to five schedule until they get in. Right. Um, whereas uh, the cyber criminals are working basically around the clock um, and trying to just look for particular weaknesses. So if you have the right controls in place, you can you can uh, get past the cyber criminals, uh, whereas it's harder to do that against state actors. Is it possible to assess sort of how cyber criminals or state actors assess sort of like the risk reward when it comes to their own efforts? Or is their thinking kind of a black box? Um, yeah, it's definitely uh, possible to do that. And I mean, on the state actor side, you know, you have intelligence communities around the world doing that all the time against each other. So uh, we know that that, that 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 that's done on the on the criminal side. I mean, you see a lot of that from the the um, different uh, security companies that have their uh, investigations that they do and the reports that they put out. Um, so we we do see uh, focus on particular particular criminal gangs. Um, you know, someone like Krebs on security, they always, he, he, uh, Brian Krebs does a great job in terms of focusing on sp specific actor sets and kind of highlighting, um, you know, what their techniques are, what their tactics are, what they're getting out of it, why they're doing it, um, which I think helps people to understand why they need to, might want to pr prioritize controls, right? A lot of times we focus a lot, maybe too much on attribution. Who is doing this rather than the control it takes to stop them but sometimes that attribution helps us to figure out which control it is we need to use so uh I, you know i think that getting the right control is the most important piece of it uh if if getting the attribution and and the 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 analysis behind it gets you to getting that control in place uh particularly for cyber criminals then then we need to do that Ari, is there value for enterprises in understanding the motivations of these cyber criminals and should they allocate resources in this particular direction? Yeah, so I think larger enterprises have been doing a better job of that. And that, that's sort of what I was getting at uh, at the end of that was like, you know, um, I've had a, I had a federal uh, regulator say to me uh, not so long ago that uh, it used to be when they would try to go after companies for not having for, for not doing great security. It was very easy for them to do because uh, no, they weren't doing anything, and now they just make consistently the wrong choices, right? So, uh, and, and if, if companies continue to, to spend money on the wrong thing, then then uh, that's that's where the problem is more today. So, um, you know, especially that's especially true, I think, for the large companies. So, if we can get the large companies to kind of think a little bit more and be creative in this space and, and demonstrate that they're solving the problems that they've had in the past. I think number one, uh, so they learn from their mistakes, I think is a key point here, but also 
that uh, they're looking at to, uh, to the next trend. And part of that means working together and things like ISACs. And, and um, you know, uh, we work very closely with the health ISAC for, for example, they do a great job of sharing that kind of information of doing exercises with, with a lot of the health companies. Um, we just need more people to do it. So big picture, Ari, how do you think the world's sort of largest enterprises, right? How can they stay secure as their operations and their ecosystems become more complex? Yeah, it is. It is staying up to date on the controls, right? Making sure that you're, you're you have the latest technologies that address these issues as as we move more into the cloud, as, as we move, you know, get, that you keep that kind of visibility that you've had in the past uh, in the macro and micro sense that I was talking about before. Um, and it's also that that your leadership is engaged with you. That the, the leadership understands where your uh, where your problems are, and that you can demonstrate growth to them, continued growth, um, and in terms of mitigating the risks. Ari, you have a perspective um, that many don't have because you've worked right inside the heart of the U.S. government in a security role. What's sort of the role of legislation or regulation? requirements or obligations and kind of encouraging or forcing larger enterprises to stay up to date on those controls that you were just talking about? Yeah, so uh, I think that, you know, regulation has become much more of a of an issue as time's gone on. We know where the problems are. Um, we know different sectors have these kind of, as I said, the profiles. Um, the regulators have are, have been learning uh, you know what works and what doesn't work, and what companies are, are have been doing in this space. They know when someone's behind. So it's. Uh, I think the key part of regulation is not necessarily to push everyone to the point where there's no problems anymore. It's pushing people to do the minimum. Right. That's really the key. Mm-hmm. You got to raise the raise all boats to a certain point to make it harder for the for the bad guys to be able to do stuff. Right? That's not going to stop everything. Right. This is again. This is an ongoing journey. Risk management in this space. Like we all, we continue to do financial risk management, even though we have regulation, all sorts of, of regulations for financial uh, in f- financial risk, um, you know, but that, you know, you got to make sure that you have the right controls in place in both, both areas. So um, in the, in the, it, it, you know, and the reason I keep comparing back to financial risk is because we know that that's what leadership understands, right? And so that, that when they talk about risk management, that's their kind of number one thought. Uh, maybe for general counsels, it's, uh, you know, legal liability, et cetera. But, you know, uh, in general, uh, everyone sort of understands the, the risk that comes in that space. Um, in some s- sectors, you know, if I'm talking to a, a retailer, I'll talk to them about in terms of the weather, right? The weather, uh, you know, you can do you can do a maximum job, the maximum available job, and you still might get hit by the weather. But the question is, you know, what did you put in place and what what did you do to, to to take action in this space to do the best that you could there? Because a lot of times it's not going to raise to that level um, and you're going to be ready. And that's the same thing here. You need to get to the point where you've where, where we need to get everyone to the point, the regulators, you get everyone to the point where we're, we're at that minimum level. We're hearing a lot more about regulation. The uh, White House is putting out the national cyber strategy um, as soon as uh you know, it's going to be, it, it, I think it's going to come out sometime in the next month and sometime in February. And at that time, uh, it's going to talk with number one on the list um, for that for that strategy. I've seen a copy of it um, is regulation in this space. It's focused on the sectors that haven't had regulation, but it, it, it does, uh, I think, get the point across. We passed the point here where people have had time to ramp up, right? We are at the point where everyone should be at that minimum level. Um, and so we are seeing sectors move into that, uh, have, sectors take up regulation in this space that haven't before. Um, that's not to say, again, that the regulation should be so high that, that, it's, uh, um, that people can't meet it with, with normal means. We should have the regulation to do the minimum that people, uh, that should be expected of uh, companies. And then over time, we can raise that. Ari, we're sitting here in the U.S., but cyber criminals we know operate globally and security is a global issue. So what about sort of regional inconsistencies in terms of these regulations? Does that sort of help raise all the boats, as you said, and help meet those minimum levels? 
It does. I also think, I mean, it, 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 the, you know, one thing that we're seeing is that the EU is acting faster than U.S. is. Um, they have a secure, a, this new uh, cyber regulations act that they are putting together now that will, over time, uh, become a, 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 an international standard in this space, um, likely because uh, com- countries like the U.S. don't have something that works uh, across all the different sectors. And it's going to, just like they did with GDPR for privacy, you're going to see the EU act in this space um, as soon as this year. That means it doesn't go into effect for several years, the way GDPR, we saw GDPR coming down the road. Um, but I think you'll see other countries react to the EU uh, in a lot, of, a lot of ways more than they'll act to the U.S. So that becomes a very important uh, legislative action for the next year and one that the Cybersecurity Coalition is working on very closely. I'm going to Brussels next week, and I know a lot of uh, people are following this very closely and want to make sure that it's done in a way that works for companies and is not um, going to be so burdensome that you end up um with a lot of the problems we had early on with GDPR. So um, you get to the point where it, where security improves, but it's something that people can handle. Ari, I want to ask you one last question. If there was one message or maybe a couple of messages from today, you've made a lot of great points in this conversation that you'd like people to really kind of take away, what would that be? Um, I'd go back to, you know, we talked about the NIST cybersecurity framework. They're, they're, you know, putting out a new version of it, but I think people can stick with the old version right now and uh, look at what they're doing, tie it to that, figure out how to measure best for them under the framework, demonstrate that over time. Uh, and then, you know, no matter who comes in and says, well, we need you to do something that maps to this, the framework can be used to map to that. So that's really like the number one point that I have for people on this on this side, those controls, obviously, there's new technologies for those controls, each individually, but you've got to figure out what you need first from the from do, in doing risk management before you figure out what those technologies and tools are that you want to map in there to get to that kind of visibility I was talking about before. Thank you, Ari. I've enjoyed our conversation. I've really enjoyed your answers to these questions, and I know that our audience is going to have a lot of questions for you later, and we'll get to those shortly. So thank you so much. Thanks, Rocky. Of course. Um, I want to ask one last uh, poll question. Is your organization more proactive or more reactive when it comes to managing cyber risk? Is it proactive, reactive, or are you not sure? If you can go ahead and answer that poll question, I'd appreciate it. And now I'm going to turn to Thor Wallace, the CIO at NetScout, for what we're going to call our rapid fire round, focused on establishing best practices. Welcome, Thor. Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful. It's so great to be here with you today. We've had a great conversation with Ari, and I'm excited for our chat. Yeah, I know. I've been listening, and it's been good. Thank you. Of course. Thor, in your role as CIO at NetScout, how do you deal with the constant risk of a cyber attack? And what have you done in recent years to help mitigate that risk? Yeah, I mean, it's a constant uh, kind of question that we're always grappling with. The way I think about it is, you know, a lot of the points that Aria was making was, you know, make it risk-based. And um, when we think about risk, we think about it both external, you know, not letting people in, but also internal. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about each of those. I mean, I think in the, from a trajectory standpoint, you know, looking back to your question, you know, kind of historically, we've been very focused and have done a lot of um, heavy lifting on the um, external side. Um, and we've taken some of those practices and brought them inside to harden the inside of us. So let me talk a little bit about what we've done in the past around hardening the edge or hardening the outside, sort of a, think of it as an M&M sort of idea, hard on the outside, sort of softer, softer on the inside. But um, some of the, the hardening that we've done is obviously reducing the, the public um, IP addresses that potentially are you know, f- focused in threat areas for, for folks. Um, we've also implemented a whole bunch of monitoring packages and, and technology that allows us to sort of see visibility, you know, have that visibility we've talked about a little bit. Um, and we've also, you know, obviously turned off services, you know, so, you know, hidden um, to the extent we can, FTP services and, and those things. 
Um, and we've also implemented uh, sort of one of our products called AED, which is a technology that actually allows us to protect ourselves against uh, DDoS attacks from the sort of the outside, but we also use it to block traffic sort of uh, that, you know, are is sort of outbound from our network out to the web. Uh, and, and we've, you know, sort of clamped down on that. So we've not sort of potentially sort of nefarious traffic coming out of our environment. So we've done a lot of work on that. Um, but one of the headlines for, for us is we've taken over from an IT standpoint and managed the edge in terms of vulnerabilities and, and sort of puts a, put a lot of rigor behind the management of our edge. So, um, so that's historically what we've been doing. And as I said, we've been focusing on taking some of those practices and hardening the inside. Um, and this has actually been driven over the last couple of years around supporting our, uh, or sort of mitigating our risk around um, ransomware. So a lot of the practices we've implemented there um, have again, really been focused on uh, on similar ideas, but let me kind of paint a little bit of a picture there. So I, before I jump into that, do you want me to just keep talking about kind of what we're doing on the inside? I mean, sort of that, that sort of a transition right into some of these other topics, but. Um, I think me... so, but I wanted to also uh, share with you, we'll get right back to that, Thor. I okay. wanted to share with you our poll results because I think they'll be, it'll oh, be something okay. for us to discuss. Um, we asked our if their organizations are more proactive or reactive when it comes to managing cyber risks. And 70% say proactive, 24% say reactive, and 6% say not sure. What do you make of that? Uh, well, I mean, I think that's that's the general trend line. Um, we're, you know, the more pro, obviously, the more proactive you are, um, the more you're leaning into this problem the more you're on top of it um, by, you know, monitoring it and actually securing um, both the edge and then internally securing that um, people are being um, far more, you know, just looking back maybe three or four years are far more uh, proactive in that. So it doesn't surprise me. And I think uh, we would fit pretty much into that profile as well. I have two questions for our rapid fire round that I want to get to Thor. Ari spoke about the importance of visibility as a foundation for effective cybersecurity. Can you tell us about the kind of platform you use at NetScout to provide that kind of visibility and how does it help your teams do their work? Yeah, so that's um, what we, so what we've, what we've done, uh, what we had actually before we thought about um, security as we've had for, for, for very many years, our ability to monitor and, and from an operating standpoint, uh, make sure that our applications, our network, and just overall our environment is as top performing as we have and what we, we could maximize. So we've been sort of using our, our technology to make sure that things are running well, if, uh, if you will, including even end user experience as well as sort of application performance, et cetera. So, We've been running that uh, sort of from an operational standpoint. What we've done is over the years is we've now started to, to use those that, that technology, including sort of packet um, visibility and inspection, and started to leverage that type of data for our security uh, requirements. Um, and, and that supports, supports us in a variety of different, very specific ways. So it, we are allowed, it allows us to sort of watch for lateral movements. Uh, it allows us for uh, actually looking for particular protocols that are, you know, sort of high risk protocols that, uh, you know, RDP, for example, or, or uh, Telnet and, you know, really trying to crack down and minimize the, the, the use of those protocols. So there's a lot of things that, um, you know, that sort of visibility supports, um, for a better environment. So we've been um, doing that. And it also has allowed us to do a far better job of uh, starting to segment our network. Um, and that's, a, you know, that we're, we're in that journey. We're not there yet, but uh, that's also helped us uh, to sort of from a ransomware, particularly from um, trying to minimize or to, to restrict the access across the network. So we've used uh, our own visibility tools and, and, and some incremental products to do a whole set of those sort of services. Thor, with those kind of capabilities that you just described to us, what would you say are some risk factors that you feel 
your team has under control. What I'm asking is really, what are the things that are not keeping you up at night anymore? Well, um, I I mean, I think, you know, everything keeps me up at night, so I'm not sure that's a good measure. But uh, I think um, I think the big the big the op- the big thing we've been able to do, and this kind of goes with another initiative we've been um, working on, and actually have stood up. We now have a a pretty active SecOps group, and um, so let me kind of paint that picture. So we we now have sort of eyes on glass, and so one of the things we've done is leverage our own visibility tool and and provided that visibility to the SecOps team that is sort of as by definition, are sort of watching our environment, making sure that, you know, if there's something um, that we need to investigate, we're investigating. And the point is, we're since we're monitoring that in real time, our response times are far quicker. So, um, so our our ability now to sort of leverage the moment to moment changes of the network to watch that, watch our um, our endpoints, watch any sort of odd looking behaviors that we want to investigate. We're sort of leveraging that um, infrastructure by having folks actually kind of watch it uh, for us. And so that's that's a, uh, has helped, uh, I think collectively everyone, including me sort of know that we're, you know, kind of being far more uh, proactive as we've talked about in the poll survey. Um, and that pro- being proactive leverages those that tooling uh, as well as uh, as the expertise in our SecOps team. So the, the combination of that, I think, has really put us in a very different um, ability to respond and prevent problems from occurring. Thank you, Thor. I'd like to now open the discussion up to questions from members of the audience. And just a reminder, you can submit them in that box below your video player. We have lots of great questions. So um, I can't wait to get into it with you and Ari. So uh, one thing I want to say was that while we're waiting is uh, uh, Thor is a, is clearly a good security professional if he uh, stays awake up at night. Up, up, up. <laughs> right. I think that goes without saying. Security professional. So yeah. Um, I've got quite, I have a lot of questions that have come in for you both. Um, so Barry's asking any thoughts on the liabilities of a critical physical systems connected to the net that might become vulnerable? And how do we protect these life affecting systems? Ari, that's for you. Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, this is a challenge that we're all dealing with right now, uh, learning more and more about it. Uh, Obviously, if you can disconnect uh, core systems from the internet, that's gonna be the best situation for people. But, uh, you know, if it is connected, at least it's better to know that it is connected and that you have like just the maximum set of controls you can have on it. It depends on the type of system it is. And, and you know, I think each of these is sort of an individual case. Uh, in talking to some of the manufacturers, I'm not gonna mention specific names, but they'll tell us, you know, they'll say that they're all customized, right? So um, they all have different things to worry about in there. So when you're talking about those kind of uh, um, ICS systems here that we're, 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 we really have to worry about industrial control system. That is, we, we really have to worry about uh, um, uh, exactly what the risks are uh, and try to do our best to pen it in and put, get the right controls in place uh, to minimize that risk. Thank you. Um, Thor, Tariq is asking, this is really for both of you. I'm going to start with you, Tor. Okay. Thor. Now that the most decent organ, the most organizations have sort of decent level of cybersecurity in place, are you seeing any new trends about the tactics used by threat actors to attack critical infrastructure sectors? Uh, I mean, I don't know if they're that new. Um, I, I mean, clearly, the worry that I think we all have as practitioners is, you know, how to, how does it all fit together, and do we have any sort of gaps in our vulnerabilities? Um, so I, I think, you know, the one that we're working a lot of, as I talked a little bit, we've been working on a lot of stuff, but one of the things that um, we've been focused on as well is just the human side of this and, you know, being hyper vigilant with um, with preventing, you know, phishing attacks being successful. You know, they come in mainly through email, uh, but, it, you know, there's lots of now vec- new vectors that are people are imagining, you know, through text and a variety of other sort of 
sort of ways of getting into people, uh, trying to reach out and 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 try to you know get the the uh, click that people want. It's going to install some software. So we've uh, we've we've been doing that. I think that's a big sort of trend and another worry that we would all have. Um, we also started to just to support you know sort of minimizing that. Um, you know we've implemented a variety of endpoint. Uh, technologies to prevent sort of uh, installing software, uh, you know, having um, uh, EDR, EDR systems that, you know, to, to have AI-based behavioral sort of uh, capability. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to do, but I do think uh, the sort of the, the, the user, the human now has really been a focus. Ari, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I mean, I, I think, uh... Thor got it, it's in a lot of it, but I would say that, um, you know, a few things that we've seen um, over the last few years in particular, which won't be a surprise to most of the people listening, but uh, just in case, I think it's clear to, it's good to say again, like the criminals have stopped caring what they're attacking. You know, this has started about five or six years ago when we started to see hospitals get hit. Um, and then, you know, schools, it's, you know, uh, so, you know, th th they don't care. Right. We thought some things were off limits. Nothing's off limits anymore. Um, they take pride almost in taking something that's uh, the most valuable offline because then they can get paid faster. So um, that I think we can't really rely on that anymore. In terms of small, medium sized businesses, one, the thing that we're seeing the biggest uptake in, up, which has been going up for years, but it's gotten worse, especially since ransomware is sort of like peaked out, leveled out a little bit. Um, is we're starting to see this business email compromise uh, type stuff that goes on all the time where they'll go after the financial units of uh, small organizations, small companies, small schools in particular. We're seeing a lot of that now uh, where they will, uh, you know, use uh, different means, often phishing, sometimes just uh, social uh, engineering to get information about the uh, company and ask the right questions and then get money sent to them uh, by changing information that you should need two or three people to approve. But um, a lot of these small organizations only have one person uh, that has to, that can make the changes to a system to send money. So once the money's sent, it's gone, so. Ari, I'm gonna stay with you for this next question, but Thor, I'm also gonna ask it to you. Aaron is asking, in your experience, is there a minimum, minimum threshold spending across all sectors that allows companies to do enough in cybersecurity programs? No, it's different. It's different for different sectors and, and I'd say different for different size companies. I mean, you'll even hear, and, and the way to really test this is talking to the insurance companies, right? And if the, the insurance companies will ask you, you know, what sector are you in? What's the size of your organization? How much personal information do you have, right? Those are the questions that they ask first and foremost, and they can give you a, uh, a general sense based on that alone. We hope that someday the insurance companies will also start really digging in deep on the questions of um, controls and what controls you have in place, and then giving you discounts based on the fact that you have controls in place. We do see some uh, insurance companies that do that and some of the specialized cyber insurance companies that do that. But that's really like, if they can't come up with that, uh, you know, across all different sectors, no one's going to be able to, right? They've, they've looked into this for, for many years. So uh, I would say those are the main questions to ask and then the controls that you put in place on top of it. Thor, did you want to answer that one as well? Yeah, why don't you, can you repeat it for me? I just uh, was kind of... Oh, absolutely. That's not a problem at all. Um, in your experience, Thor, is there a minimum threshold spending across sectors that allows companies to do enough in cybersecurity programs? Uh, I mean, I, I I can't speak to the the general industry, and, but for me, the um, there is. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of uh, yeah. I mean, it's all based on risk, and so it's hard to sort of cap it. Uh, obviously, there's a practical cap um, that we all you know as. The CIOs feel uh, pretty much every day that there's a limit. Uh, and I think this is why you go back to risk. Uh, I mean, kind of, I think if you have clarity over your your own company or your uh, your industry that's unique, maybe in terms of the risk that you're facing or as a company, what those risks are, I think that's the focus that will help um, kind of guide in terms of where you prioritize, what things you prioritize and where you go. Um, but I, I don't think... Um, 
there's a cap. Um, Thank you. All right, there's a couple of questions for you. Jennifer's asking, how can enterprises meet the new level of regulatory challenges when they are already operationally restricted, right, with the anticipated cybersecurity regulation changes for 2023, along with the layoffs that folks have been seeing? Yeah, it's that's. I mean, it's going to become challenging for people. And again, I, I think you know we want to see these regulations hit kind of that raise the raise all boats. And so, if you're doing enough already, then there's less that you'll have to to do specifically there. But that's not all the way that all regulators are going to look at it. Certainly not in the uh, in the EU. Uh, you know, they're going to expect some basic. Um, they're going to try and move uh, the high end higher as well. So I think that. Um, you know, we we need to uh, uh, we're going to have to see what that looks like over time. I think that there will be uh, some orientation towards like compliance based solutions um, in some areas, just so that people can demonstrate it. And that takes people, right? We've seen that with the banks, where they'll have like, you know, we're, we're trying to get the banks to, to in working with some of the uh, bank organizations, we're trying to get to a point where people can do a single audit. And then have that demonstrate for a, for a lot of different places, um, but they still have situations, especially in the U.S., where they well they get six or so six to eight audits a quarter, and then they have to do the, each one of those audits separately, looking at the same stuff. That it leads to a lot of compliance workers on staff that have to deal with that. They could be doing security. That money could be going to security alone. And then if you get budget cuts. Where does that come from? So uh, I totally understand where she's coming from in this space. And, they, they, you know, that's one of the reasons we're trying to make these uh, regulations, because there will be more regulations. But the question is, how do we make them most efficient and make the most sense for the different sectors uh, and don't end up with a situation where you have lots of you, you need lots of compliance people on staff? Ari, George is asking, what impact do you think the recent announcement by the government allowing intelligence and law enforcement communities to go on the offensive to sort of hack back the adversaries? Well, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think that it, it, it I think that, that it was overstated in the articles that came out there and talking to the government about it a little bit more, um, that we haven't seen like a wholesale change uh, towards hack back. Um, it's, it is much more though uh, of the monitoring what's going on and being a little bit more aggressive in figuring out where it's coming from and who's doing it and how to go about getting to it, right? I mean, uh, a, a lot of times what we see, you know, cyber warfare tends to be pretty asymmetric um, where the, the bad guys can hit us and we have trouble necessarily getting back to them if we are trying to do it through um, cyber means, but we have other tools that we can use um, to get to them that we need to be able to put in place, sanctions being a big one that we use with Russia, et cetera. So I think the, the, the question is like, who's doing it? Why are they doing it? What's the best way to get to them? Uh, cyber means isn't always necessarily the best way to get to them. Um, and as I said, I think there is more oversight than some of those articles you've read uh, probably suggest that there is. This question is for both of you. I'll start with you, Thor. Janet is asking, are end users still the weakest point in the security framework? Uh, the quick answer is yes. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 this is why we do not only training, but we actually do fairly regular testing of um, people, the click tests, and um, you know, unfortunately, our rates vary depending on how clever we are in terms of disguising the the test routine. Um, I mean, most recently we had one that was. We used uh, one of our major vendors and there were a number of people that clicked on it. So, yeah, I mean, that is really, um, so, you know, I, I think what you have to do as a practitioner is you have to kind of know that that's going to be a weak link and try to provide some layers of protection around that, given that it could happen. Um, so this is where sort of, the, sort of these endpoint technologies really could be very helpful um, and including, you know, sort of network while watching, you know, lateral movements and, and that sort of regimen, I think, really supports the riskiest area. Um, but yeah, that's the riskiest one. Yeah, I, I would I would say I agree with that in terms of it goes back to what I was saying at the, during when, I, when when you were first asking me questions about um, this uh, this line of um, the, the getting people from doing absolutely nothing to getting them to doing the right stuff. If you're doing if you're 
uh, on the path to doing the right stuff, then end users are the, the, the weakest link. If you've been doing nothing and you're just building a security program, the end users are, are not necessarily the, the, your biggest worry. You still have to worry about them, but you have so many other things to worry about as well. So it's really getting to that point where, you, where the end users are the weakest link that you can start to focus a little bit more on doing the real risk management that where you're where you're bringing down uh things uh, at, at the edges rather than uh um uh for a, for a more mature organization. Ben has the perfect follow up to what we're just talking about, which is how does an organization know that they have enough cybersecurity layers in place? Even with regular pen tests, you can still be missing layers. Uh yeah, you you can be. I think um I think it just it requires a careful analysis of um, you know kind of a pathway for nefarious software um, you know entering the environment. You sort of have to have at least one protection layer, maybe even a couple, um, and you try to make. I mean, I think Ari talked Ari talked about this before. You try to make it hard enough where maybe they you know don't they give up and they go some. No, somewhere else, but, you know, hopefully they stop, but, uh, but you try to prevent that as much as you can. Um, so we do that, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, we have various layers, both at the endpoint, as well as the server level, as well as the cloud level. Um, you know, so we, we do as much of the redundancy that, um, that we think is practical. So, you know, and, and you have to weigh this practically speaking with user experience. I mean, obviously we could make this environment so tight that you couldn't get your job done. So, you know, that's always the constant sort of balancing act that we all have to have to sort of uh, be aware of. That's a really good point. Um, I'd say, you know, we, we have people uh, that come to us all the time and say, we want the best red team to come in and make sure that they can't get into our systems. The best red team is getting into you, your system at some point. If you're, if you're talking about the best, in the world, they're getting into your systems. So there's always more you can do, right? But we try to put people off of like, you know, before you get to that point of having the red team, like, let's talk about, let's have a blue team go in and make sure all your controls are in place. Let's make sure that, you know, you've done the extra basic tabletop exercises uh, on this, that if you've done that, then, then we can talk about doing some, the, the, some of the more technical, you know, higher end pen tests, et cetera. And then we can talk about red teaming and figuring out where the edges are, right? So there's, a, there's, this, there's this step process to getting to that point where, uh, you feel comfortable. Yeah, the best red team is going to get in it and maybe we'll learn something from the best red team. But if you bring the best red team in before you get to that point, uh, they're going to get in and you're going to find about, out about something, but there's still going to be hundreds of more things that you need to do. So you want to get it down to that smaller set of things that is constantly changing, you know, new things on the network that you're learning about and getting down to that point rather than uh, just looking at, um, you know, the at, at one small area when you need work everywhere. Ari, I got a couple of questions for you. George is asking with new regulations and compliance forthcoming, in your perspective, how much teeth will they have regarding really enforcement and fines for companies that fail to comply? Oh, I think the EU is looking at very heavy fines <laughs> and, and, and uh, it's a question of enforcement, right? They, they there's they have a mixed record on enforcement, and it will probably depend on what different countries and how they implement it um, there in terms of enforcement. But I think the fines when they do implement will be very high. Um, in different sectors in the U.S., you're going to see different things, right? We always fall in that way, um, and that's mostly. I don't think people understand where that comes from. A lot of that is just congressional oversight, right? Congress writes the laws. It's about jurisdiction with the, with the committee that writes the law, right? So uh, a com one committee might have a really like feel really really needs to be done and be able to get convinced, you know, everybody involved, both parties and all the different factions within those parties to say, oh, we should have high fines in this area. Something bad just happened. We need to find them highly. So you're going to end up with a like all over the map in terms of different le levels of fines and in, in terms of what needs to be done in different sectors. In the U.S., that's just the way we, we legislated le legislate here. Um, there is, you know, there's some efforts to kind of even that out. I think you see that you'll see that in the national strategy. Some discussion of that, 
that's coming out. Um, and you know, hopefully we can make some progress there, uh, move up some of the sectors that are not doing as much and uh, you know, have some more cooperation with the sectors where there is too much. Ari, I want to get to one last question. I think we can make it on time. Connor's asking your thoughts on the NIST AI framework that was published five days ago. Will AI help with overall cybersecurity? Yeah, so I mean, I, I love this question. I think this is where, you know, policy is going in the future. There's a lot of discussion on AI. Uh, NIST has a lot of different frameworks. And one of the things they want to do with the cybersecurity framework is map it to these other frameworks. They have a privacy framework. Someone on our team was one of the, the people that helped to write that. So this all maps together now. You have these different frameworks. And AI is a huge area. There's the pro side of AI for security, and there's the, the con side. Of AI. Let me start with the con side, which is the bad guys are using it too, right? Like there's been some experiments already with even G chat GPT where people are like, how do I go about attacking? And then we'll give you some advice on to attack, how to attack people. So, um, right, that's just, the, and that's the bare minimum of like the kind of AI that could be used for on the attacker side. Uh, but then on the, on the pro side, right, like the, we have seen tools that learn, right? And if you can get that kind of visibility we we're talking about before, and you can tie an AI engine to it, perhaps a lot more of this becomes automated in the cybersecurity area. So th the protections come into place automatically. That would really be a key growth area for us. And I'll say the, the National Science Foundation has been investing in this back to when I was in government. I mean, like they, they saw this 20 years ago, like this that's the way we're gonna get there. And because of that, um, we have a lot of different efforts in security AI. Um, and I think we're ahead of the attackers in terms of using AI for the good side of it. Um, it's always, you know, the, the, the good guys have to be right all the time and the bad guys only have to be right once uh, to, to have an impact. So um, it is uh, hard to, you know, say, Right, that that uh, we're going to continue to win this battle, but right now I'm feeling pretty good about like you know, automation is is moving in a good direction. We're using AI for security purposes, and that's really a great note for us to end on. I can't believe we're at time. Ari and Thor, thank you for your time. This was really an insightful and interesting conversation, and we really appreciate it. Great to work with you guys. Hope to do it thank again. You. You thank too. You. And also a big thank you to all of you who were watching, attending, and participating in today's event. You asked great questions. The polls were really insightful. So thank you for that. And a big thank you to NetScout for sponsoring this event. You should see a survey link at the top right of the screen when you click on the bell icon for notifications. Please take a moment and share your thoughts. We'd really love to hear from you. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.